a very good evening to all the attendees of this webinar. I welcome you from the Dwarf Waters Kluwer to be a part part of this webinar, which is on a topic of anatomy of the cerebral hemisphere, the cerebrum. The key objective that we're going to have from this webinar is describe the parts of the cerebral hemisphere, describe the surfaces and borders of the cerebral hemisphere, describe the poles and lobes of the cerebral hemisphere, and describe the sulci and gyri in the superolateral, infolateral, and medical surface of the cerebral hemisphere, describe the boundaries and content of the interpendicular fossa, and enumerate the areas according to the broadband areas. Our session is being held by and, 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 and being presented by Dr. Kumar Sati who doesn't have, who doesn't need any more, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, introduction, but Dr. Sati Kumar Ravi, he's a professor of additional and of anatomy of all Indian Institute of Medical Sciences, Rishikesh. He's also editor in chief of National Journal of Clinical Anatomy. He's also additional proctor and assistant controller of examination and also an ex sub dean and assistant dean of academics. So let us start our session, you know, with Dr. Sajish Kumar Ravi. Dr. Sir Ravi, sir, sir, I request you to please uh, share your slides for the, today's session. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Okay. So, good evening, one and all. First of all, I would like to thank uh, team Walters Clover for organizing this guest lecture on a very important topic of neuroanatomy. And uh, my special thanks to Mr. Ravi Shukla for inviting me to deliver this guest lecture. I always love to interact with the budding docs of our country. And why so? Because you are the future of our country. And someday, if you see, if we need your services in the hospital, you will always be there uh, to give a smile to not only to me, but to all the uh, gloomy faces who comes to you with a ray of hope. So thank you so much uh, for attending this webinar. It's because of you, the webinar is a grand success. And I'm very happy to know I've been told that around 1500, 1400 uh, people have registered for the, uh, this webinar. So that's a huge number. Thank you so much. Now, just to introduce already introduction has been given. I'm a digital professor working in the Department of Anatomy at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Rishikesh. Apart from that, I'm the editor in chief of National Journal of Clinical Anatomy, which is a voice of clinical anatomists of India and official publication of the Society of Clinical Anatomists. I'm delighted to share uh, that on recommendation of the editorial board of Gray's Anatomy, I was offered and requested to review uh, the 42nd international edition of Gray's Anatomy. And indeed, I feel honored and blessed to contribute to upcoming 43rd edition of Gray's Anatomy, which is expected to come by the year 2025. And most importantly, I am also the chief editor of Snail's Clinical Neuroanatomy which is the South Asian edition, uh, which is read globally and undoubtedly it is considered as the Bible of anatomy. So this is all about, I would like to uh, say about the introductory part. Now, this is the competency as per the National Medical of Commission that describe and demonstrate surfaces, gyri, poles and functional areas of the cerebral hemisphere. And I will be covering uh, these headings, the objectives of the Today's lecture will be uh, following. And then I will not be wasting much time because it's a long lecture because I have to cover so many things like uh, you say the development, introduction, external features, lobes, sulci and gyri, structure, and then the functional area. Now, the very first question when we hear the cerebrum. So the first question which comes to our mind is why we should learn anatomy of the cerebrum, isn't it? 
So what I can say that the cerebrum represents one of the largest regions of the brain. Uh, we have discussed in the previously also in the past, right? So when you talk about the different parts of the brain, the cerebrum is the largest region you say of the brain which covers it. And you have just a scene in the picture in the very first slide. And when you talk about the functions of the cerebrum, right? It is very critical uh, for the survival of the individual. It is responsible for the uh, processing information which are associated with the, uh, you say the moment, smell, uh, sensory perception, you can say language, communication, memory, and even what we are learning right now, all these are the various functions of the cerebrum. So now, before we discuss about the cerebral hemisphere, let's have a brief idea about the development of the brain. Now, when we see over here, this brain develops from enlarged cranial part of the neural tube and at about, you say, the fourth week of the uh, intrauterine life, you can say that enlarged cephalic part shows three distinct dilatations you can uh, make out over here, the progencephalin, the mesencephalin, and then we have the rhombencephalin, right? So these three distinct dilatations, these are called as the primary brain vesicles. And as I said, from uh, this cranio Cordially, you say it is the forebrain, midbrain, or the hindbrain. Otherwise, I said the progencephalin, the mesencephalin, and then the rhombencephalin. When you see their cavities, right, the cavities of these three vesicles, what we have mentioned over here, right, these forms the ventricular system uh, of the adult brain. And when we move towards the fifth week of the development, during the fifth week of the development, you will find that both the progencephalin and the rhombencephalin over here when you see. So this is the rhombencephalin and the progencephalin. So during the fifth week of uh, this uh, subdivide into two vesicles further and those producing the five uh, secondary brain vesicles you can see over here. That is the telencephalin, diencephalin, uh, metencephalin. Uh, we have the myelencephalin and all these apart from these four, we have the mesencephalin, that is the uh, midbrain, right? So when we see this progencephalin, this progencephalin gives a rostral telencephalin, whereas the caudally you can see over here is the diencephalin. Now, the telencephalin, what happens? That it develops a lateral diverticula by imagination, you can say, which enlarges, overgrow, and cover the caudal, which is you have the diencephalin to form the cerebral hemisphere. Now, when you talk about this diencephalin, it becomes hidden in the lower parts of the cerebral hemisphere and forms the thalamus. We have the uh, hypothalamus, the epithalamus, metathalamus, etc. All these things will be found by the diencephalin. Now, when you talk about this mesencephalin over here, you can appreciate this mesencephalin gives rise to the midbrain, as I mentioned. Now, it doesn't show much changes. When you talk about this mesencephalin it, or the midbrain, it doesn't show much changes, but in the early part of the development, if you see, except that its cavity gets narrowed to form the cerebral aqueduct. Now, when we talk about this rhombencephalin, this rhombencephalin, as I said, that it divides into the metencephalin, rostrally, you can say, which eventually develops into the pons and the cerebellum. And caudal, as I said, the myelencephalin, which gives rise to the medulla oblongata. Over here in the same you, slide, you can see over here, this is the brain. Over here, we have the brain divisions are the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. So over here, this brain stem divides into uh, three. That is the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. That's what I said, that four brains, the further divides into the telencephalon and the diencephalon. The, we have this mesencephalon, whereas the rhombencephalon divides into the metencephalon and the myelencephalon, the telencephalon which will eventually develop into the cerebrum. So this is what I wanted to say over here, that the cerebrum uh, develops or formed from the telencephalon. Now, when we see over here, this is the diagram of the cerebral hemisphere, you can see. So what I said, that the cerebrum is the largest part of the brain, and it consists of the two cerebral hemispheres. I can You can see over here, the right cerebral hemisphere and the left cerebral hemisphere. So when you talk about this uh, cerebral hemisphere, it 
when you see over here in this diagram, right, we have this cranial cavity. In the cranial cavity, when you see, there are three cranial fossa. Anteriorly, we have the anterior cranial fossa. In the middle, we have the middle cranial fossa. And posteriorly, you can appreciate, we have the posterior cranial fossa. Now, in the posterior cranial fossa, you can appreciate over here the largest foramen present in the cranial cavity, the foramen magnum. So what I wanted to say that when you talk about the cerebral hemisphere, it's the two uh, cerebral hemisphere will be partly separated by a longitudinal feeser. We call it as the over here. You can see over here and these right and left cerebral hemispheres are separated. There is a, a gap over here. You can appreciate this is the median longitudinal feeser. Now what I said that when you see this cerebral hemisphere, this occupy the two cavity or the two fossa, the anterior and the middle cranial fossa of the cranial cavity. And apart from this anterior and the middle cranial fossa of the cranial cavity, it also occupy the supratentorial region of the posterior cranial fossa, right? Not over here, but what I said that it covers the supratentorial region of the uh, posterior cranial fossa. Now, as I said that the two cerebral hemispheres are separated by the longitudinal cerebral hemisphere over here, which you can appreciate this is the corpus callosum, which is present and the two cerebral hemispheres are joined together by a largest commissural fiber, you say, right? And this largest commissural fiber, it is called as the uh, corpus callosum. So when we see there are other commissural fibers as well, like we have the anterior commissural fibers, we have the hippocampal uh, commissural fibers of the fornic. So what I wanted to say that the two cerebral hemispheres are connected by the largest commissural fiber, which is called as the corpus callosum, which you can appreciate over here. There are the different parts of the corpus callosum. We have the rostrum, genu, the body, and the posteriorly you can see is the splenium, right? So this, I said uh, the uh, this uh, corpus callosum, the fibers of the corpus callosum, the interconnecting uh, fibers you say are connects the two cortical areas or the two cerebral hemisphere, uh, which uh, lies in the floor of the longitudinal fissure. So this is over here. You can appreciate this is the corpus callosum. There are the different lobes we'll be discussing in the coming slides. Now, when we talk about the each cerebral hemisphere, when we talk about the each cerebral hemisphere, I said it consists of the uh, gray matter over here. You can see the outer surface layer. You can see this is the gray matter, right? So this is called as the cerebral cortex and a central core will be there and that is called as the white matter. So what I said that each cerebral hemisphere consists of a surface layer of gray matter, which is called as the cerebral cortex and a central core, which is called as the white matter. Now, the basal part of the central core consists of large masses of the gray matter known as the basal ganglia or the nuclei. Over here, you can see uh, in this diagram that we have this putamen and the globus pallidus. Together, it is called as the lentiform nucleus. And then apart from that, you will be getting uh, over here, you can see the corpus callosum. So corpus callosum. And over here, you have this putamen and the globus pallidus. These are the basal nuclei, right? So each cerebral hemisphere, when you see over here, right, uh, will have the, towards the periphery, towards the outer aspect, I said, will have the gray matter, right? And towards the core, if you see, we have the white matter. Now, when we see over here, I said the each cerebral hemisphere will have a cavity and that cavity over here, you can appreciate this is called as the uh, lateral ventricle. This lateral ventricle will be continuous with the third ventricle. So over here, you can appreciate, I said that each uh, cerebral hemisphere will contain a lateral ventricle and this lateral, lateral ventricle will be continuous with the third ventricle, which you can appreciate over here. This is the third ventricle. So over here, you have the lateral ventricle and this is the third ventricle. Now, uh, this, uh, lateral ventricle will be continuous with the third ventricle through this interventricular foramen, right? So this is uh, a brief about the cerebral hemisphere. Now coming to the uh, the external features of the uh, cerebrum. Now when you see this, each cerebral hemisphere will have three surfaces. Over here in the diagram, you can very well appreciate 
this is the supralateral surface right over here in this diagram you can appreciate this is the medial surface whereas apart from that the supralateral surface and the medial surface we have the third surface and that surface we call it as the inferior surface so this is inferior surface this inferior surface is further divided into two that is anteriorly we have the orbital surface and posteriorly we have the tentorial surface so what i said that each cerebral hemisphere has three surfaces now the supralateral surface is the most convex and most extensive you can see over here this is the supralateral surface and it faces upwards and laterally and it conforms to the corresponding half of the cranial vault now when we talk about the medial surface it is flat you can appreciate over here right and it presents a thick c-shaped structure and that c-shaped structure i said is the largest commissural fiber which is called as the corpus callosum now when we talk about the inferior surface when you see this inferior surface it is irregular and to adopt the floor of the various cranial fossa what i mentioned that is the anterior and the middle cranial fossa now it is as i said that it is divided into two parts by uh, by over here you can appreciate the stem of the lateral sulcus right so it is divided into two parts by a deep horizontal groove or the sulcus you say that is the step stem of the lateral sulcus now when this stem of the lateral sulcus it divides the inferior surface into two parts i say when you see these two parts anteriorly you can see is a small anterior part which is called as the orbital surface whereas when you see towards the posterior aspect right towards the posterior aspect there is a large posterior part and this large posterior part it is called as the tentorial surface right so these are the three surfaces you will be getting in the uh, cerebral hemisphere right one i said the supralateral surface which you can appreciate over here another i said is the medial surface and the third one i said is the inferior surface which is further divided into the orbital surface and the tentorial surface now when you see this cerebral hemisphere now these cerebral hemisphere will have three poles right each cerebral hemisphere will have a three poles and these three poles are called as the frontal pole right we have the temporal pole and then we have the occipital pole now in the diagram you can appreciate over here this is the frontal pole this is the temporal pole and posteriorly you have the occipital pole so the frontal pole is the anterior end right this is the anterior end uh, which is more rounded than the occipital pole you can say whereas when you talk about this occipital pole this is the posterior end just as i said uh, the frontal pole is the anterior end similarly the occipital pole is the posterior end and when you talk about this occipital pole this is more pointed than the frontal pole then coming to the third pole third pole is the temporal pole which is between the frontal uh, lobe you can appreciate over here and this is the temporal lobe i will be discussing the different lobes in the coming slides so what i wanted to say that the temporal pole is present between the frontal and the temporal lobe and it is pointed forwards right so there are three poles the frontal temporal and the occipital pole i hope i am clear now coming to the different borders when we see there are basically three borders one is the supramedial another is the infralateral and then we have the inframedial again this inframedial is further divided into the infra uh, medial orbital over here you can see towards the anteriorly and then towards the posterior aspect you have the medial occipital so that's how it comes to the four borders so what i said that we have the uh, four different borders like we have the supramedial border in the diagram you can appreciate over here this is the supramedial border what we are seeing from the supralateral surface you can appreciate over here this is the supramedial border right this view you can appreciate from the medial surface so this is the supramedial border right now i said apart from that uh, this supramedial border we have the infralateral border so over here which you can appreciate either you see this side red color structure which i have colored over here or this you can see over here these are the infralateral borders right this we call it as the infralateral border 
in each cerebral hemisphere, right? So we have the supramedial border and then we have the infralateral border. Then if you see over here, this is, is the medial orbital border and posteriorly towards the posterior aspect, you have the medial occipital border. So when we talk about the supramedial border, this supramedial border, it separates the supralateral surface from the medial surface. You can see over here, this is the supralateral surface and this is the medial surface. So supramedial border, it's separating the supralateral surface with the medial surface, right? Now, when we talk about this infralateral border, this infralateral border, right over here in this diagram, you can appreciate this infralateral border separates the supralateral surface. You can see over here, this is the supralateral surface from the, what we say, the tentorial surface, right? So uh, if you see over here, uh, we have the tentorial surface posteriorly, right? And anteriorly, we have the uh, medial orbital surface. Over here, you can appreciate this is the orbital surface, right? So as a whole, what I said that this is the inferior surface. So in nut cell, you can say that this infralateral border separates the supralateral surface with the inferior surface. That is all about the infralateral border. Now coming to the medial orbital border, when you see over here, this is the medial orbital border. Now, when we talk about this medial orbital border, this separates the medial surface, right? From the, uh, you say, this is the orbital surface, right? So this medial orbital border will be separating the medial, if you have this medial surface, right? This is the medial surface. So this will be separating the medial surface with the, you say, the orbital surface, right? So this you have is the medial orbital border. Coming to the medial occipital border, which is lying posteriorly. So this medial occipital border separates the medial surface with the tentorial surface, right? So over here, you have this is the medial surface. So this medial surface will be separated by this tentorial surface from this, the medial occipital border. So these are the different borders, which you can appreciate over here in the diagram. That is the supramedial border, right? Over here, you can see this is the supramedial border. Then we have the infralateral border, and then you have the medial orbital border, and then posteriorly you have the, the medial occipital border, and together it is called as the infromedial border, right? So this is all about the different borders. Now coming to the different lobes. Now in the diagram, you can very well appreciate the different lobes. So the very first lobe which you can appreciate over here is the frontal lobe, right? And then just posterior to the frontal lobe, you can appreciate over here is the parietal lobe. Inferiorly, you can appreciate the temporal lobe, right? But when you dissect, right, when you uh, reflect this lateral sulcus is over here, when you dissect and reflect the two parts, right, uh, of you say the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe in the deep, you will be getting the insula. That is the another uh, lobe you can say over here, right? So what I said, we have the frontal lobe, we have the parietal lobe, we have the temporal lobe, and then we have the occipital lobe posteriorly. So these are the main lobes over here. And another lobe, which is deeply situated, sometimes we call it as the insula. So what I wanted to say that when you talk about the lobes of the cerebrum, there are main four lo lobes are there. And these four lobes are the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and then we have the occipital lobe. So they, basically, these are the four main lobes. Apart from that, sometimes this insula is considered another lobe, which is deeply situated over here. Now, when we see the supralateral surface of each cerebral hemisphere, right, you can see that the supralateral surface, it is divided into the different lobes. The four lobes, what I said, is the frontal lobe, right? Over here, you can see this is the parietal lobe, and this is the temporal lobe, and over here, you have the occipital lobe. Now, how these uh, different lobes are divided? Now we have the different sulci are there. Now, what is the literal meaning of the sulci? Whatever the groups are there, whatever the depressions are there, are called as the sulci. And whatever the elevations are there, we call it as the, uh, the groups. Uh, if you see over here, that are called as the gyri, right? So there are two things. One is the sulci and another is the gyri. The gyrus is the singular word and the gyri is the plural word. So what I said that when you see this supralateral surface, 
there are basically important sulci are there and these are the central sulcus which you can appreciate over here then you have this is the lateral sulcus and apart from that we have this parieto occipital sulcus which basically you find on the medial surface right this parieto occipital sulcus basically which is present on the medial surface but a small portion of this parieto occipital sulcus you will be getting on the suprolateral surface as well so basically these are the three main sulci the central sulcus the lateral sulcus and the parieto occipital sulcus and apart from that there are two imaginary lines you can see over here these are the two imaginary lines which divides the cerebral hemisphere or the uh, suprolateral surface or the medial surface you say into the different lobes now what are those two imaginary lines first imaginary line which you can see over here you extend one uh, draw a line from this parieto occipital sul uh, sulcus right and extend this imaginary line to the pre occipital notch which the pre occipital notch you will be getting 5 cm from this occipital pole so draw this imaginary line between this parieto occipital notch to the pre occipital notch now draw another imaginary line right we'll be discussing about the different rami of the lateral sulcus so in nutshell uh, over here i would like to, to say that there are three rami of the lateral sulcus we have the anterior ramus we have the ascending ramus and this is the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus now to draw the second imaginary line what you have to do that you draw another imaginary line extend it from the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus and join it to the first imaginary line which you have drawn from the parieto occipital sulcus to the pre occipital notch this will divide the the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe and posterior to this first imaginary line which you have drawn from this parieto occipital uh, sulcus to the pre occipital notch posterior to that you have the occipital lobe so what i said that the first imaginary line is a vertical line joining the parieto occipital sulcus to the pre occipital notch and the second imaginary line i said is the backward the posterior continuation of the horizontal part of the posterior ramus the posterior ramus is there you extend it so the second imaginary line is the backward or the posterior continuation of the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus till it joins the first line right now the when you see this frontal lobe this is the frontal lobe so the frontal lobe lies anterior to the central sulcus right the frontal lobe i said it lies anterior to the central sulcus and it is in front of the upper part of the first if you see over here this is the uh, lateral sulcus right so just superior to that right you have this frontal lobe right so below it is bounded by the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus right and if you see over here so what i said that you have the central sulcus anterior to the central sulcus you have the frontal lobe posterior to the central sulcus right and the anterior to the first imaginary line and superior to the second imaginary line which you have extended from the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus is the parietal lobe so this is the frontal lobe and then you have the parietal lobe right so below if you see this posterior lobe below it is bounded by the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus and the second imaginary line this is as a whole if you see superior to this is the parietal lobe now coming to the temporal lobe when you see this is the temporal lobe which is lying below inferior to this posterior ramus of the lat lateral sulcus and the second imaginary line and anterior to the first imaginary line this whole uh, portion the area if you see it is the temporal lobe right so when you talk about the fourth lobe that is the occipital lobe it is separated from if you see the uh, parieto occipital sulcus and the pre occipital notch you have drawn the first imaginary line the posterior to that you have the occipital lobe so occipital lobe lies behind the vertical line joining the parieto occipital sulcus and the pre occipital notch so i hope i am clear this is all about the the different lobes of the cerebrum on the uh, medial surface if you see this is the parietal lobe over here you have the frontal lobe right and this is as a whole is the parietal lobe if you see over here 
posterior to the central sulcus is the parietal lobe and anterior to the parieto occipital sulcus right this is all is the parietal lobe anterior to the central sulcus complete area if you see over here this is the frontal lobe right and inferior to this if you see uh, you have this center uh, lateral sulcus right and the imaginary line which you have drawn from the pre occipital notch right this is this is the temporal lobe the posterior to that you have is the uh, occipital lobe so these are the different lobes you will be getting on the superlateral surface or the medial surface now the another lobe what i was mentioning is the fifth lobe right so apart from this frontal lobe parietal lobe temporal lobe and the occipital lobe we have the fifth lobe that is sometimes it is called as the insula so this insula i said when you have this lateral sulcus right you just reflect the two parts that is the uh, you have uh, the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe just reflect that beneath that you will be getting the insula so this is the submerged portion right so insula is considered separately from the uh, four main lobes what we discussed right and it is the submerged portion of the cerebral cortex which is present in the floor of the lateral sulcus right so it has been submerged from the surface during the development of the brain you can say due to the overgrowth of growth of the surrounding cortical areas and which can be seen only when the lips of the lateral sulcus or you say the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe when you reflect it beneath that right when you uh, pull apart these two parts you will be able to see this insula so when you see this uh, insula it is triangular in shape right and it is surrounded by the circular sulcus now when you see over here it is as i said that it is triangular in shape right and it is surrounded by the central sulcus circular sulcus it is there when you see over here uh, it has an apex right which is lying inferiorly and this apex if you see it is called the limen insulae which is continued with the anterior perforated substance now when you see over here the insula it is divided into two regions the anterior region over here you can appreciate and this is the posterior region right so the anterior and the posterior region are separated by this sulcus the we call it as the central sulcus right so this central sulcus which you can appreciate over here right this is the central sulcus over here divides into two region this region if you can appreciate over here is the anterior region and posteriorly which you can appreciate over here this is the posterior region now when you see uh, these areas either you talk about the anterior area or the posterior area these are termed the frontal or the frontoparietal and the temporal opercula they, uh, that is because it is uh, just beneath this operculum right it is the lid or the covering these areas are called as such right now when you see the superior surface of the temporal operculum which presents the anterior and the posterior transverse temporal gyri you can appreciate over here in this diagram these are the long gyrus and over here anteriorly if you see over here these are the short gyri you can appreciate over here right so this is all about the insula if you appreciate now coming to the different sulci and the gyri we will be discussing in detail so as i said that we have the sulcus right the uh, singular word is the sulcus and the plural is the sulci so whatever the depressions are there right in this schematic diagram you can appreciate is are the sulcus and whatever the elevations are there these are called as the gyrus so each cerebral hemisphere when you see right it shows a complex pattern of the convolution you say and you can appreciate in this diagram or you can appreciate over here and these Convol uh, convolutions you say are the gyrus or the plural i said these gyri are there and these gyri are separated by some of the furrows of the varying length these are you can appreciate over here these are the furrows of the varying length and these are called as the sulcus or in plural we say the sulci now now when we see this convoluted structure these increases the surface area right so what i said when we see this sulci these are defined as the depressions or the fissure in the surface of the brain while the gyrus when you see these are the elevations or the ridge on the cerebral 
cortex. Now, what are the different types of sulcus? We will see individually the main sulcus. Now, when we see the types of sulcus, right, or the types of sulci, it has been divided or the classified on the basis of the function, on the basis of the formation, and then on the basis of the depth. Now, when we talk about the classification of the uh, sulci or the types of the sulci on the basis of the function, so on the basis of the function, these are the limiting sulcus, these are the axial sulcus, and then we have the operculated sulcus. Now the question arises, what do you mean by the li limiting sulcus? So the limiting sulcus will be defined as the sulcus which separates at its floor, right? So what do you mean by that? Means it separates the two areas which are not only functionally, but even structurally are different. Like we have the central sulcus between, you say, the motor and the sensory areas, right? So I repeat, I said, the limiting sulcus separates at its floor and it not only separates uh, the areas which are on the basis of the function, but areas which are structurally different. And the example I said is the central sulcus, which are present between the uh, motor and the sensory area. Now coming to the next, that is the axial sulcus. Now, what do you mean by the axial sulcus? Now, the axial sulcus develops in the long axis of the rapidly growing homogeneous areas, like we say the post called calcarine sulcus, which is present in the long axis of the straight area. Coming to the third one, that is the operculated sulcus. Now, these operculated sulcus separates or separated by its lips into two areas, and it contains a third area in the walls of the sulcus, like when we see the lunate sulcus, which we will see in the, uh, you say, the uh, occipital lobe, right? So the lunate sulcus is an operculated sulcus separating the straight and the parastraight areas. Now coming to the, this, these are on the basis of the function that is limiting axial and the operculated. Coming to the uh, different types of sulci on the basis of the formation. Now when we talk about the formation, these have been classified as the primary right sulci and then we have the secondary sulci. Now the question arises, what do you mean by the primary sulci? So primary sulci are formed before the first, right? These are independently uh, existing. You say like the central sulcus. So central sulcus are the primary sulcus, right? Now, what do you mean by the secondary sulcus? Now, when we see this secondary sulcus, these secondary sulcus are produced by various factors, right? So what I said that the primary sulcus are present before the birth, right? It exists independently, whereas the secondary sulci are produced by various factors other than the, you say, the enormous or the profuse growth in the adjoining areas of the cortex. Like we have the lateral sulcus, right? Then we have the parito-occipital sulcus. So these are the secondary sulcus. Now there are the third type of sulci and these have been classified on the basis of the depth. And these are the complete sulci or you say the incomplete sulcus. Now, what do you mean by the complete sulcus? The complete sulcus will be very deep, right? The complete sulcus will be very deep. So as uh, uh, because of these complete sulcus, you can say that the elevations will be produced in the walls of the lateral ventricle, right? So example, you can say like we have the collateral sulcus or you say the calcarine sulcus, these are the complete sulcus. Because of these sulci, you see that there are elevations in the walls of the, the lateral ventricle. We have the different ventricles, like lateral ventricle, third ventricle, we have the fourth ventricle. You will be, uh, in the coming webinar, we will be discussing about the ventricles of the brain as well, right? So this is what I said, that we have the complete sulcus. Now, when we talk about the incomplete sulcus, these are superficially situated. These are, the depth is not too much, right? It are, these are superficially situated. Like I said, there are two uh, types of uh, sulci on the basis of the depth, you say. One is the complete, which is uh, uh, deeply situated. The depth will be there. Whereas another is the incomplete sulcus, which are superficially situated, right? And these incomplete sulcus or the incomplete sulci will not be very deep, right? Like 
the example when you see of the incomplete sulcus are the paracentral sulcus right so these are the different types of sulci on the basis of function on the basis of formation and then we have on the basis of depth i hope i am clear right so i'll not repeat once again i'll just proceed further because this lecture will be too long right now we'll see the different sulci the main chief sulci there are different various sulci we cannot discuss all the sulci but the main the important sulci the chief sulci we should discuss now when we see the lateral sulcus right you can see over here in this diagram these are the the very first sulcus which you will appreciate over here in this diagram i have already shown this is the central sulcus right this is the central sulcus then we have the lateral sulcus over here the three rami you can you can appreciate right the anterior rami this is the ascending rami and then we have the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus then apart from that you can see over here i said the parieto occipital sulcus which is mainly present on the medial surface right this parieto occipital sul uh, sulcus when you say this is the suprarenal surface because of that only you are not able to appreciate that much this parieto occipital sulcus because it is present on the medial surface so the another is the parieto occipital sulcus the fourth main sulci we will be discussing is the calcarine sulcus right so we have the calcarine sulcus which is present on the uh, medial surface we will be discussing right so these are the different sulcus we will be discussing one by one first we will discuss the lateral sulcus so this is the lateral sulcus you can see over here in this diagram the beautiful sulcus you can appreciate right and the different ramus you can appreciate in the different color right so when we say this lateral sulcus it is very important why it is because it is most conspicuous you can say of all the cerebral sulci and i said it has a stem right this lateral sulcus has a stem and then it has three ramus three beautiful ramus are there one is the anterior ramus anterior horizontal this is horizontal you can see right and then we have the anteriorly another ramus is there and going upwards so it is called as the ascending ramus or the anterior ascending ramus and because the third ramus it is going towards the posterior aspect right so it is called as the posterior ramus i hope i am clear right so the stem and the sulcus if you see this stem of the lateral sulcus right it begins as a deep right cleft on the inferior surface of the cerebral hemisphere right and when you see this lateral sulcus of the stem i am talking about this is present at the anterior perforated substance and it extends laterally to reach the suprolateral surface you can appreciate over here to reach the suprolateral surface on reaching this suprolateral surface it divides into three what are those the anterior rami the ascending rami and then you have the posterior rami right so anterior ascending and the posterior rami now the three rami of the lateral sulcus diverge from each other at a point and that point it is called as the sylvian point right i repeat i said the three rami of the lateral sulcus what are those the anterior ascending and the posterior rami of the lateral sulcus diverge from each other at a point and that point it is called as the sylvian point right now we'll see the next sulcus that is the central sulcus now when we see this central sulcus very important this is another important sulcus you can appreciate over here on the suprolateral surface basically it is present on the suprolateral surface but it begins on the medial surface right this central surface uh, this central sulcus it is also called as the fissure of rolando you can see over here the spelling it is the central sulcus it is also called as fissure of rolando so what i said that when you talk about this central sulcus it begins by cutting the supromedial border you can appreciate this is the supromedial border i am uh, showing from the suprolateral surface right and you can see towards the medial surface the supromedial border so what i said that when you say uh, see this central sulcus right it begins by cutting which border the supromedial border right of the uh, the cerebral hemisphere you can say right uh, uh, when you write any message it reflects on the screen so i would request 
that you write later on, right? That the central sulcus begins by cutting the supramedial border of the hemisphere. Which hemisphere? The cerebral hemisphere. Either you talk about the right cerebral hemisphere or you talk about the left cerebral hemisphere. Now the question arises from where? Even when we talk about the supramedial border, from where it begins, right? So it begins by cutting the supramedial border of the cerebral hemisphere about one centimeter behind the midpoint taken between the frontal, right? The, taken between the frontal pole and the occipital pole. I repeat, I said one centimeter behind the midpoint between the frontal and the occipital pole. You take the point on the supramedial border. From there, it will begin. It will come on the supralateral surface, right? And runs, right? It runs. If you see over here, it runs downwards, right? It is coming downwards. Curvedly, you can say, and it comes forwards, right? You can see over here, it is coming downwards and forwards, right? And ends just above the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus, you can see, right? So its upper end usually extends into the medial surface, whereas it ends on the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus. I hope I'm clear, right? Now, when you see over here, this is uh, the primary motor cortex over here. You can see we'll be discussing the sensory areas, right? And then uh, we'll be discussing about the primary somatosensory cortex also, right? All these things we'll discuss. Uh, leave it right now. We'll just discuss about the sulcus, right? I hope I'm clear about this uh, central sulcus. I'll skip for further, right? Now coming to the next sulcus, that is the calcarine sulcus. Now over here, in the this is the medial surface. That is what I was talking about. This is a supralateral surface, and this is the medial surface. So when you talk about this calcarine sulcus, this calcarine sulcus is basically present on the medial surface, right? So when you see this uh, calcarine sulcus, which is present on the medial surface, right, of the cerebral hemisphere, it begins as a deep fissure, right? It begins as a deep fissure, a little below to the posterior end of the corpus callosum. If you see this beautiful structure, right, this is the corpus callosum. This is the anterior end of the corpus callosum, and this is the posterior end of the corpus callosum. Now, I already said that the corpus callosum has the different parts, right? The towards the anterior most, if you see a thread-like structure, you can appreciate is the rostrum. This is the genu, this is the body, and this is the splenium. Why it is important? Because when you see this splenium, right? This calcarine sulcus, it is in relation to the, the posterior and the posterior part of the corpus callosum, that is the splenium, right? So it begins just little below to the posterior end of the corpus callosum that is the splenium and follows an arched course you can see over here an arched course you can see over here right the which whose convexity if you see will be towards the upward right towards superiorly right towards the occipital pole if you see over here and it will extend slightly onto the Suprolateral surface. So this is the suprolateral surface over here. You can see this is the calcarine sulcus, right? So we have discussed the lateral sulcus, we have discussed the central sulcus, and then we have discussed the the beautiful sulcus. This is called as the calcarine sulcus. The literal meaning of calcar is the spur, right? So basically, where it is present, it is present on the medial surface, right? Now another very important sulcus is the parieto occipital sulcus, right? What is that? The parieto occipital sulcus, right? So the blue structure, the blue color you can see over here, right? This is the parieto occipital sulcus. I have mentioned this parieto occipital sulcus so many times when we were discussing about the parietal lobe, right? On the suprolateral sulcus. I said on the suprolateral surface, this parieto occipital sulcus is present minimally. Basically, you will find on the medial surface, right? So when we see this parieto occipital sulcus, I said it is present on the medial surface, beautiful flat medial surface you can appreciate over here, right? And it begins on the at the midpoint of the calcarine sulcus, right? It begins at the midpoint of the calcarine sulcus, right? 
uh, if you see uh, how to uh, means what is the course over here, right? So I said that it begins. If you see over here, this is the uh, plateau occipital sulcus. So I said that it begins at the midpoint of the calcarean sulcus and it courses upwards. You can see over here it courses upwards and slightly backwards, right? To cut the which border over here, the supramedial border of the hemisphere about five centimeter in front of the occipital pole. I said previously also that when you draw an imaginary line, right, the first imaginary line, where you will write, uh, draw that five centimeter from the occipital pole. Either you say the pre-occipital notch, right, the pre-occipital notch in fairly, or you talk about the parieto occipital sulcus, right? So it cuts the supramedial border. I said on the cerebral hemisphere about five centimeter in front of the occipital pole, and it will extend slightly on the suprolateral surface, which we have uh, seen over here. This is the suprolateral surface over here. You will be getting right. Okay. Now this is all about the parieto occipital sulcus. Now, coming to the different surfaces, right? So, when we see over here in the suprolateral surface, right, you can see in this diagram, you can very well appreciate. Uh, wait, just hold on. Okay. So, if you see uh, the sulci or the garai on the supralateral surface, this you can appreciate over here. This is the frontal lobe. Now, we'll see the very first thing. Uh, we'll uh, discuss uh, these sulci or the garai uh, lobes wise. First, we'll discuss the frontal lobe and accordingly, we will take the different lobes. So, let's see about the frontal lobe on the supralateral surface, right? So, on the frontal lobe in the supralateral sulcus uh, surface, on the supralateral sul uh, surface, you can see over here, this is the pre-central sulcus, right? Over here, the red color, which I have marked over here in this diagram, is the pre-central sulcus, right? And central sulcus, we have already described, right? The green color structure, which you can appreciate over here, is the central sulcus, right? So, the gyrus, which is present anterior to the central sulcus and posterior to the pre-central sulcus, is the pre-central gyrus, right? So, when we see over here, I said this is the pre-central sulcus, right? When you talk about this pre-central sulcus, right, it will, often it will be broken into two or three parts when you see uh, in the cerebrum. Though I have drawn a single line over here just to make it clear to all of you, but it, it is not like that. It will be when you see in the specimen, in the dissection hall, uh, when you will take the specimen of the cerebrum, right, when you will find this pre-central sulcus, it will be broken into two to three parts, right? And it will be, when you see this pre-central sulcus, it will be running downwards, right? And forwards, just parallel to the this central sulcus, the beautiful sulcus, the green color mark, right? It will be running downwards and forwards to the, parallel to the central sulcus, right? And as I said, it is anterior to the central sulcus. So, as I said, this pre-central gyrus will be present between the central sulcus and you have the pre-central sulcus. So, posterior to the pre-central sulcus and anterior to the central sulcus or otherwise you can say the pre-central sulcus, posterior to the pre-central sulcus, you have the central sulcus and anterior to this pre-central gyrus, you have pre-central sulcus, right? Aap aise ke hai? Both things are same. Now coming to the another sulci. When you see over here, this you have we have discussed the pre-central sulcus. Coming to this frontal lobe over here towards the anterior aspect, right? Now when you see over here, right in this uh, table you can see over here we have the superior frontal sulci, right? You can see over here, right? Yellow color marked. We have just marked for the your convenience, right? So that very well you can appreciate. This is the superior frontal sulcus and then inferiorly you can appreciate yellow color. This is the inferior frontal sulci, sulcus. It is individual, so it is sulcus, right? So superiorly we have the superior frontal sulcus, right? And inferiorly we have the inferior frontal sulcus, right? Now 
these two sulci, the superior and the inferior sulci, will divide into the different gyrus. Superior to this superior frontal sulci is the superior frontal gyrus, right? In between the superior frontal sulci, right? Or inferior frontal sulcus, I said in between the superior frontal sulcus and inferior frontal sulcus, you have the middle frontal gyrus. I hope I'm clear, right? I said the superior to the superior frontal sulcus is the superior frontal gyrus in between the superior frontal sulcus and inferior frontal sulcus, we have middle frontal gyrus, right? Then if you see inferior to this inferior frontal sulcus, we have inferior frontal gyrus. I'm repeating this time because my main audience is the first year MBBS student. I don't know in some of the institutions, uh, this might not have started, but in my institution, if I say we have started the neuroanatomy when we, he requested, and because I'm the editor of this snails clinical neuroanatomy, so I, Walter Clover requested me to give talk on the topics concerned to the neuroanatomy, right? So this is the area, this is the reason why uh, we are talking about the neuroanatomy topic, right? So what I was saying that these are the different uh, sulci are there, the superior frontal sulci and the inferior frontal sulci, these sulci will divide this into the different gyrus, right? I hope I'm clear. Now, when we see over here, this superlateral surface, in fairly, if you see over here, right? Now, in the uh, lateral sulcus, which was uh, dividing into the uh, three rami were there, the anterior, uh, and then we have the ascending and the posterior ramus, right? Now, when we see this anterior and the ascending rami of the lateral sulcus, right? This is the anterior and the ascending rami of the lateral sulcus. This divide this inferior uh, frontal gyrus. I have just now we discussed about the inferior frontal gyrus, which is inferior to the inferior frontal sulcus, right? So this inferior frontal gyrus, it is divided into the different area, the different region by the different rami of the lateral sulcus. This is the anterior rami and this is the ascending rami. And this anterior rami and the ascending rami of the lateral sulcus divide into three regions, the A, B, and C. The A is pars orbitalis. This area, it is called as the pars orbitalis. This B area between this anterior and the ascending rami, this is the pars triangularis, whereas between this ascending and the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus, this area, we call it as the pars opercularis. Very important it is because when we'll discuss the functional areas, the we will discuss about the area number 45 and 44, right? That is the pars triangularis and pars opercularis, right? So what I said that the three ramus of this lateral sulcus will divide the inferior frontal gyrus into three areas. We have the pars orbitalis, the, uh, the part between the anterior and the ascending rami is the pars triangularis and the posterior to this ascending ramus, ramus you say is the pars over polaris. You can see over here the pars orbitalis, pars triangularis, and pars opercularis A, B, C. I hope I'm clear. Now coming to the, the parietal lobe. The, this is all about the frontal lobe coming to the parietal lobe. Now when we see this parietal lobe, right, in the parietal lobe, you can see over here, we have seen the central sulcus, which is dividing the frontal lobe, and posterior to the central sulcus, we have the parietal lobe, right? Now, when we see this central sulcus, just posterior to that, we have another sulcus, and that sulcus we call as the post-central uh, sulcus, right? This is the post-central sulcus, right? So, what I said, just posterior to this central sulcus, there is another sulcus, and that sulcus we call as the post-central sulcus. Now, the gyrus, which is present between the central sulcus and the post central, posterior central sulcus, you say, right, is the posterior central gyrus. So this is the posterior central gyrus, right? Now, when you see over here, just posterior to this posterior central sulcus, right, you have, if you see over here, right, 
the intraparietal sulcus is there and this has been marked by the blue color you can appreciate over here this is the intraparietal sulcus right this is the intraparietal sulcus and this intraparietal sulcus divides the two we superior to that we have the superior parietal lobule so this area which you can appreciate over here is the superior parietal lobule inferior to this uh, intraparietal sulcus if you see this area as a whole where we say that is the inferior parietal lobule i repeat superior to this intraparietal sulcus we have superior parietal lobule the inferior to this uh, infraparietal sulcus we have inferior parietal lobule i hope i'm clear clear right now apart from that which you can appreciate over here this is the lateral sulcus right the area, the white color uh, marked structure area you can appreciate over here is the supramarginal gyrus, just angulated over here. You can see this is the supramarginal gyrus, whereas this another, if you can appreciate over here, is the angular gyrus, right? So this is all about on the parietal lobe. Now coming to the next, if you see over here, that is on the temporal lobe, just now we were discussing. So over here, this is the lateral sulcus, right? Apart from that, in the temporal lobe, which you can appreciate over here, we have the superior temporal sulcus marked in the yellow color, right? Inferiorly, you can appreciate over here, another sulcus is there, right? And this beautiful sulcus, it is called as the inferior temporal sulcus, right? So in the temporal lobe, the mainly two sulcus are there, right? One is the superior temporal sulcus, which you can appreciate over here right this is the superior temporal sulcus and then inferiorly i said we have the inferior temporal sulcus now these two sulcus the superior temporal sulcus and the inferior temporal sulcus will have the different gyri will divide into the superior temporal uh, gyrus if you see over here this is the sorry uh, it is uh, uh, typing error is there this is the superior temporal gyrus then we have the middle temporal gyrus and then you have we have the inferior temporal gyrus right so what i wanted to say that when you see between this lateral sulcus and superior temporal sulcus right we have the superior temporal gyrus right i apologize this has been written sulcus this is not sulcus this is gyrus right i repeat i apologize this is not sulcus these are the gyrus right so i said between the posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus and then we have the superior temporal sulcus. This is the superior temporal gyrus, right? Then between this superior temporal uh, sulcus and the inferior temporal sulcus, we have the middle temporal gyrus. This area, right, this ridge or the elevation, we call it as the middle temporal gyrus. Inferior to this inferior temporal sulcus, we will call it as the inferior temporal gyrus. So we have two sulci on the temporal lobe that is the superior temporal sulcus inferior temporal sulcus and this will divide the temporal lobe will have the main three gyrus the superior temporal gyrus the middle temporal gyrus and then we have the inferior temporal gyrus right now another important thing what i wanted to say over here when you see the superior surface of the superior temporal gyrus it presents two transverse temporal gyri over here in the same uh, superior uh, temporal gyrus and this the two transverse temporal gyri if you see it will be uh, it is the anterior when we see over here it is the anterior transverse temporal gyrus and it is also called as the hessel's gyrus which forms the primary auditory area of the cortex i repeat i said the anterior transverse temporal gyrus it is called as the Hessel's gyrus, which forms the primary auditory area of the cerebral cortex, right? So this is all about on the supralateral surface of the temporal lobe. Coming to the, if you see over here, this is coming to the occipital lobe when we see over here, right? This is the occipital lobe posterior to the uh, first imaginary line, which you have drawn from the parieto occipital sulcus to the preoccipital notch right over here we have the occipital lobe now in the occipital lobe you will be getting the 
three important sulcus and these are the transverse sulcus which you can appreciate over here yellow marked structure right this is the transverse sulcus another if you can appreciate over here, here the red color structure the red marked area is the lateral sulcus right and the third beautiful sulcus which you can appreciate over here is the lunate sulcus so there are three sulcus main sulcus which you will appreciate on the occipital lobe and these are the transverse sulcus right the transverse sulcus the lateral sulcus and then we have the lunate sulcus right these are present on the suprolateral surface now we'll see on the medial surface right now very beautiful diagram you can see the beauty of snail's neuroanatomy uh, so many feedbacks they have given the diagrams are beautiful right you will get plenty of diagrams you can see the clarity of the diagram right so over here on the medial surface if you see right the cingulate sulcus very well appreciate you can appreciate in this diagram this is the cingulate sulcus right this is the cingulate sulcus now when you see uh, the cingulate sulcus it is the most prominent sulcus you will find uh, on the uh, one of the most prominent you can say on the medial surface right and it follows a curved course around one centimeter above and parallel to the upper convex margin of this cor uh, corpus callosum this is the corpus callosum right so over here if you see it is just approximately one centimeter above and it is parallel to the upper margin of the corpus callosum you can see this is as a whole you can appreciate this is the cingulate sulcus right this is the cingulate sul sulcus now anteriorly if you see it ends below the genu of the corpus callosum you have this is the rostrum of the corpus callosum and this is the genu of the corpus callosum so what i said that anteriorly it ends below the genu of the corpus callosum whereas posteriorly when you go right posteriorly it turns upwards right to reach the supramedial border of the cerebral hemisphere right so a little behind the upper end of the central sulcus right a little behind the upper you say the upper end of the central sulcus so the area between this cingulate sulcus right the area between this cingulate sulcus and the corpus callosum if you see it is called as the cingulate gyrus the name itself suggests we have the cingulate sulcus so the gyri is the cingulate gyrus i i hope i am clear right so this is the cingulate sulcus right and the uh, the gyrus which is present between this corpus callosum and this cingulate sulcus it is called as the cingulate gyrus right okay now coming to the another sulcus if you see over here on the medial surface that is the callosal sulcus right that is the callosal sulcus over here you can appreciate in this beautiful diagram again right this is the uh choroid plexus over here you can appreciate right so when you see over here uh this callosal sulcus if you can appreciate this callosal sulcus it is dividing towards the anterior part right we have this paracentral lobule and the medial frontal gyrus right so over here if you see this is the calcarine sulcus you can appreciate over here right very well you can appreciate this if you see over here this is the calcarine right so if you see over here this is the calcarine sulcus this is the parieto occipital sulcus and over here you can appreciate is the collateral sulcus now when we see this callosal sulcus uh, if you see this is the callosal sulcus a uh, just superior to this corpus callosum you can appreciate right now what i wanted to say that anteriorly we have this paracentral lobule you can appreciate over here this is the paracentral lobule right and over here if you see this is the medial frontal gyrus right the medial frontal gyrus uh, you appreciate over here towards the posterior region if you see you will be getting the calcarine sulcus you have this cuneus region and just anterior to that you will be getting the precuneus region so what i wanted to say that when you see over here this area we call it as the paracentral lobule this is the precuneus over here we have the cuneus 
right on the medial surface the different gyri if you appreciate the different reason if you can appreciate this is the uh, cuneus over here just uh, in, uh, in at anterior to that we have the precuneus this is the uh, para uh, central lobule you can appreciate over here if you can appreciate this is the medial frontal gyrus right so i repeat i said we have this Callogel sulcus, which separates the cingulate gyrus, right? Which separates the cingulate gyrus from the corpus callosum. So throughout, which you can appreciate in this diagram, this is the uh, callogel sulcus over here, right? Which is separating uh, superiorly, we have the cingulate uh, gyrus, and inferiorly, we have the uh, this corpus callosum. Now, what when we see this anterior part of the medial surface between this cingulate sulcus, which you can appreciate over here, right? The between the cingulate sulcus and the supramedial border of this cerebral hemisphere, right? Which is divided by a short, you can say, uh, opposite ascending uh, sulcus, you can say cingulate sulcus. This area I said is the uh, medial frontal gyrus and over here you have this paracentral lobule, right? So these are the reasons over here. When we see over here, a small part around the upper part of the central sulcus this if you see over here this is the central sulcus and upper part of this uh, cingulate sulcus which you can appreciate this is the uh, you say the paracentral lobule right this is the central sulcus you can appreciate so what i wanted to say i just repeat over here this is the uh, medial frontal gyrus right this is the paracentral lobule over here we have this the cuneus region over here you can appreciate Right, and just pre, uh, prior to that, you have the precuneus region. So these are the areas you will be getting on the uh, medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere. Now, when we talk about this inferior surface, now the inferior surface, it is divided into two parts. We have the orbital part, and then we have the tentorial part over here. Now, when we see this orbital part, in the orbital part, we have the orbital sulcus, right? which is present in the edge shape you can appreciate over here and towards the medial aspect if you appreciate this is the olfactory sulcus over here you can appreciate and this olfactory sulcus which is marked in the yellow color right which is dividing just medial to that over here you can see the vertical shape this is the gyrus erectus over here so this is the olfactory sulcus and over here edge shaped structure which you can appreciate right this red color area this is the orbital sulcus and which is this edge-shaped orbital sulcus it is dividing this orbital area right orbital surface uh, laterally into the anterior this you can see is the anterior over here you can see this is the anterior over here you can see this is the medial this area it is the lateral and over here you have the posterior right so this is the edge-shaped orbital sulcus so what I wanted to say that when you see over here, uh, this orbital surface, it is divided into two uh, part. One is the medial and the lateral, right? The medial, you, you can see over here, is the gyrus rectus, right? Which is being separated by the presence of the olfactory sulcus, right? So the olfactory sulcus, when you say it is the vertical or the straight sulcus, which runs anteroposteriorly, you can see which runs anteroposteriorly close to the medial border of the orbital surface. Now, this ol olfactory sulcus, why it is called as the olfactory sulcus? Because when you see in this sulcus, the olfactory bulb and the olfactory tract, the, this is the olfactory tract will be there, right? And over here, anteriorly, you will be getting the olfactory bulb. Now, this area medial to this sulcus is called as the gyrus erectus. Now, this is what I said, I just repeat that we have the irregular edge-shaped sulcus that, that is divides this orbital surface into anterior, posterior, the medial, and the lateral orbital gyri. So this is all about the orbital part. Now coming to the next that we can see over here in the next, that is the temporal, right? Now, in the temporal part, if you can appreciate over here, the two sulcus, which is very prominent over here, it this is called as the collateral sulcus over here. You can appreciate, and this is the 
occipital temporal sulcus which you can appreciate over here this is the occipital temporal sulcus and this you can appreciate over here is the collateral sulcus now when we see this tentorial surface right so i said it is marked by two major sulci one which is running anteroposteriorly right the medial one and it is called as the collateral sulcus right and the lateral one which you can appreciate over here this is called as the occipital temporal sulcus now the when we talk about this occipital te temporal sulcus it is continuous around the infro lateral margin right it is if you see over here it is continuous on the infro lateral margin with the inferior temporal gyrus now posteriorly when you see this collateral sulcus right it is parallel to the calcarine sulcus it is parallel to the this is the calcarine sulcus over here so what i wanted to say that posteriorly when you see this collateral sulcus it is parallel to the calcarine sulcus so i hope i am clear over here right now this is all about this now when you see the area between this occipital temporal sulcus right this is the occipital temporal sulcus so the area between this occipital temporal sulcus laterally and the collateral and the rhinal sulcus if you see rhinal sulcus medially will be there is known as the medial occipital temporal gyrus right so it is called as the medial occipital temporal gyrus i said that the area between this occipital temporal sulcus laterally right and the collateral and the rhinal sulcus medially is known as the medial occipital temporal gyrus the area lateral to this occipital temporal sulcus is termed as the lateral occipital temporal gyrus so this area if you see over here this is called as the lateral occipital temporal gyrus now this if you see this lateral occipital temporal gyrus it is continued around the infro lateral margin of the hemisphere with the inferior temporal gyrus right so this is all about the temporal part or the tentorial part you can see over here now when we see in the next the histology i will uh, not be discussing uh, because of the scarcity of time but i can say over here right that this is the towards the outer aspect if you see you are getting the gray matter right and towards the central core if you can appreciate in the cerebral hemisphere you will be you will be getting the uh, what you say the white matter right so when we see over here i said towards the periphery towards the outer aspect we have the gray matter and towards the inner aspect we have the white matter now when we see the different cells these are the different cells you will be getting right that is the pyramidal cells the stellate cells you can appreciate over here right and the fusiform cells you can uh, see over here the shape and then apart from that you will be getting the horizontal uh, cells of the sesel and you can appreciate over here the cells of the uh, martinotti right so these are the different cells you will be getting now these are the different layers you will be getting and the when you see structurally you will be studying in the histology these are the different layers the molecular layer the external uh, granular layer over here the third one is the external pyramidal layer we have the internal granular layer the ganglionic layer and then we have the multiform layer so these are the various layers you will be able to see when you see under the microscope right now coming to the when we see the different broad man's area right very important it is and when we see uh, this gentleman over here in the uh, photograph right the full name you can see over here is, is the corbinian broadman right so this corbinian broadman is a german neurologist you can say and he was born in the year of 1868 and passed away in the year 1918 you say uh, based on the uh, cyto architecture right he identified 52 distinct areas and these distinct areas had been named it is called as the broadman's functional areas of the cerebral cortex right primarily these uh, areas are divided uh, you can say into the sensory areas the motor areas or you say the association areas right so we'll see the different areas in the coming slide so that's what i said that functionally if you see these areas has been classified as 
the primary areas, right? The secondary functional areas, and then we have the association areas. Now, when we see the cortical, the very first means when we see this primary areas, right? So the question arises, what do you mean by the primary or the secondary areas? Or you say the association areas. So when we see this primary areas means the cortical areas, which will be responsible for the elementary functions. Either it is, it may be the motor or it may be sensory will be the primary area. I said, I repeat, I said the cortic cortical areas which are responsible for the elementary functions, be it the motor or the sensory will be the primary area. Whereas when we talk about the secondary areas, right, the secondary areas are located, right? Just suppose if you see over here, we have this primary motor area, right? So just near to that, whatever will be there. So secondary areas are located around the primary area, right? So every primary area near to that will be the secondary areas and that will receive the afferent projections, uh, you say, from the corresponding primary areas and the thalamus. And they are responsible for the integrating or you say the integration of the raw signal which are uh, from the primary areas and whatever the informations will be received from the thalamus to refine the primary area stimuli, right? Now coming to the, the third one, that is the association areas, right? Now, when we talk about the associ association areas, so the association areas are those areas, you can say, are the uh, cortical areas that integrate, process, or you say, uh, the analyze the different kinds of the stimuli, right? Uh, which are, which reaches, you say, the brain and are involved in the mediating the higher mental functions. I repeat, I said the association areas are those areas which are present on the cortex, the cere cerebral cortex, which integrate, right, process and analyze the different kinds of the stimuli which reaches the brain and which are involved, which participate in mediating the higher mental functions. So these are uh, the uh, association area, right? So the I said the primary areas are those, right, which are responsible for the elementary functions, right, be it the motor or the sensory. The secondary areas, I said that these will be located around every uh, primary area, right? And then the association areas, I said that these are the cortical areas which will help in integrating, processing, or analyzing the different kinds of the stimuli right which reaches the brain so this is all about the different functional areas now we'll see the different functional areas now when we see over here in the frontal lobe right this you can appreciate over here in the frontal lobe this is the primary motor area when we talk about this frontal lobe right it makes up you say that it covers the major portion one third of the cerebral cortex you can say right so We'll uh, discuss with respect to the location, you say the area number and what are its function, right? And then what will happen if there is lesion to that area, right, in different lobes of the cerebrum. So what I said that this, when you talk about this frontal lobe, it covers the one third part of the cerebral cortex, right? Now, when you see in the frontal lobe, the primary motor area, that is the area number four over here, you can appreciate, right? This is the primary motor area just anterior to the central sulcus, right? Or if you see, this is the precentral gyrus, right? So this is the primary motor area, area number four. Just anterior to that, if you see over here, this is the secondary motor area, the area number C, six, you say, or you say the pre-motor area or the secondary motor area. This we call as the area number six, right? Now, apart from that, if you see over here, we have the supplementary motor area, right? So what are the supplementary motor areas? If you see over here, the motor speech area of the uh, Broca's speech area, the area number 44 and the 45, you can see over here, that is on the pars triangularis and the pars opercularis, right? So what I wanted to say that when you see over here, we have the pre-central area, which is situated in the 
precentral gyrus and it includes the anterior wall of the central sulcus right and the posterior part of the superior right posterior part of the superior right the middle right and then we have the inferior frontal gyri which extends over the supramedial border of uh, the hemisphere you can say into the paracentral lobule as well right so these are the different primary motor areas i said over here right the area number four now when we see over here this is the yellow marked structure you can appreciate over here this is the area number four the broadman's area four which i said which is present on the precentral gyrus now the precentral area which may be divided into the posterior and the anterior regions right which now when we talk about the posterior region which is referred to as the motor area or the, you say the primary motor area that is the broadman area four i said right this occupies the precentral gyrus right extending over the superior border uh, supramedial border you can say into the paracentral lobule right now when we see over here it controls the voluntary motor activities right of the opposite half of the body right this primary motor area i said that this controls the voluntary motor activities of the opposite half of the body now what are the cells you will be getting over here the pyramidal cells will be there that includes the cells of bud but uh, beds and the 40 percent of the pyramidal fibers arises from this area that is the primary motor area now suppose if there is a lesion to this area what will happen right now if there is a lesion to this area in one hemisphere produces paralysis of the extremities i'll call later right i mean the lecture So what I was talking, I was talking that if there is a lesion to this area, right, it will produce the paralysis of the extremities of the opposite half of the body, right. I said that if there is a lesion to the primary motor, motor area, right, it will produce paralysis of the extremities of the opposite half of the body, right. So this is, sorry, huh. now this diagram is very important, right. When you see this diagram over here, right, this is the, the moment areas of the body has been represented over here, right? And how it has been represented? It has been re represented in inverted from the precentral gyrus, you say. The starting from below, if you say, right, uh, and passing superiorly are the structures which are involved in the, uh, you say, the swallowing and the tongue, you can see over here, right? The swallowing, the tongue, the larynx will be there, you have this eyelid the eyebrow right and the next area which you can appreciate over here is the extensive region of the movements like the fingers right especially the thumb you can appreciate over here then you have the hand the wrist you can appreciate over here right then <coughs> you have the elbow <coughs> So I said, you have the elbow, you have the shoulder, right? And then you have the trunk you can appreciate over here, right? Then apart from that, if you can appreciate over here, the movements of the hip, you can appreciate over here, right? The hip, the, the figure is well appreciated. You can appreciate easily. Then you can appreciate the knee over here, right? Then you can appreciate the ankle, right? So these are represented in the highest areas of the precentral gyrus, you can say, right? And the movements of the toes, if, if you can appreciate over here, or uh, this, this is presented on the, the medial surface of the, the cerebral hemisphere in the paracentral lobule, right? So this, if we see the, uh, the movements of the anal and the visceral sphincters are also located in the paracentral lobule. So the area of the cortex, which are controlling a particular movement is proportional, right, to the degree of the skill involved in the movement, right? In performing the movement, you say, or and is unrelated to the mass of muscle participating in the movement, right? Whatever the movement uh, means, the degree of the skill is involved accordingly, the area has been given, right? So the size of the area 
is proportional to the degree of is, uh, skill involved with the movement. You can see over here, the this area is more covered over here. You can see the skill is required more. So the area is more. So accordingly, I wanted to say, right? Now, when we see over here, in the next slide, the coming to the pre-motor area, right? We have discussed about the uh, primary motor area. Now coming to the pre-motor area. Now, when we see this, uh, the pre-motor area, this is the anterior region and this anterior region, it is called as the pre-motor area or you say the secondary motor area, the area number six, you say the Broadman area is six and the parts of the areas you will be getting over here is the area number eight. Right? Over here, you can appreciate that is the area number 44 and the area number 45, right? So when you talk about this, the premotor area, right? It occupies the whole, this anterior part of the precentral gyrus and the posterior part of the superior, right? The posterior part of the superior, the middle and the inferior frontal gyrus and it extends into the medial surface of the hemisphere as well, right? Now, when you talk about this premotor area, which is wider superiorly, you can appreciate in this diagram, which is wider superiorly than below, and it, it is going narrow downwards to, you can say, uh, confined uh, to the part of the precentral gyrus, right? And when we talk structurally, structurally, it doesn't have any uh, the giant pyramidal cells of the beds, you can say, right? So when the electrical stimulation of this pre-motor area is produced, uh, uh, is there, right? What happens that it produces the muscular movements, you say, the, which is similar to those which are obtained by the stimulation of the primary motor area. So this is all uh, you can say about uh, the stimulation or you say the pre-motor area. What I wanted to say that whenever stimulation uh, will be to this area, right in the uh, movements of the you say the opposite or the contralateral limbs there will be a stronger stimulus is required uh, the stronger stimulus is very necessary uh, than what you say the primary motor area which is stimulated so when you even when you remove this supplementary motor area or the pre motor area uh, it doesn't produce the uh, permanent loss of the movement you can say right so whenever there is a lesion of the premotor area, there will be difficulty in performing the skilled movements. So this is all uh, about the premotor area. Now in the frontal lobe, coming about the frontal eye field, which you can appreciate over here, the middle frontal gyrus towards the over here. Now in the, when you see this frontal eye field, right, it extends forward, right? It extends forwards from the frontal area of the precentral gyrus, right? So when you see over here, this is the precentral gyrus and this is the frontal area. You can appreciate the, that the anterior or the facial area of the precentral gyrus, you say, and it extends into the middle frontal gyrus. You can appreciate over here, right? The parts of the Broadman area, you can say the six, eight and the nine. This is the over here, you can say the area number six, and over here, you will be getting the area number eight and similarly, you will be getting the nine, right? So these are the parts of the Broadman areas of six, eight and nine, right? Now what happens that whenever you will be giving the stimulation of to this region, right? The uh, stimulation, I mean to say the electrical stimulation to this region, it will cause the conjugate movement of the eye. Means what I wanted to say that it controls the conjugate movement of the I, right so the frontal eye field or you say the broadman's area eight controls the conjugate movement of the eye right now when you see over here right whenever there will be unilateral damage to area number eight it will cause the conjugate deviation of the eyes to the side of the lesion right what i said that whenever there will be lesion right this area number eight will be affected right it will cause the conjugate deviation of the eyes to the side of the laser, right? So this is all about the frontal eye field. We have to uh, see the time also. Uh, now coming to the prefrontal 
cortex when we see this prefrontal cortex right over here this area you can see this is the prefrontal cortex right now in front of the premotor area you say right it is called as the pre you have the motor area you have the this is the primary motor area this is the a pre-motor area you can see over here right then you have the frontal eye field and then what i was talking right now is the prefrontal cortex that is in front of the pre-motor area this is the prefrontal cortex now when we talk about this prefrontal cortex these are highly developed in the human beings right so this and you can see that how much area it is covering so when we see this prefrontal cortex it covers extensive area the wide area right and which is present anterior to the pre central area and it includes the greater parts of the superior the middle and the inferior frontal gyri the orbital gyri you will be getting towards the medial aspect uh, inferiorly you can say right and most of the medial frontal gyrus will be there right basically you can appreciate so this are the areas which are being covered by uh, this you say the area number uh, the you say the nine and the prefrontal cortex you can say or you say the frontal association areas you can say right what are the functions of this you can say over here right this regulates the depth of the filling right whatever the fillings are there so that this regulates the fillings you can say right so when you say this broadband areas like 9 10 11 and 12 all these area you will be getting over here in the anterior half of the cingulate gyrus you can say right now coming to the large numbers of the efferent and the efferent pathways will be connecting this prefrontal area you can say right with the other areas of the cerebral cortex like you have the thalamus the hypothalamus and the corpus stratum so this is all about the prefrontal cortex over here you can see these are the area number 9 to 12 you can appreciate over here right now this prefrontal area as i said is concerned with the the individual's personality also right the makeup of the individual's personality you can say so as a result of this the whatever the inputs are received from the many cortical or the you say the subcortical sources just now i said the cortic cortex the thalamus thalamus and the hypothalamus other parts of the brain you say right so the area which are placed right it regulates the personality the you say the personality of the individual or you say the person's depth of the feeling right so apart from that it also exerts the you say the initiative and the uh, you say the judgment capacity or the judgment of an individual so these are the functions or the uh, of the prefrontal area you can say over here you can see this is the frontal lobe rostral to the uh, motor and the premotor area you can say in the diagram so i said this is concerned with the individual's personality the depth of the emotions be it the social moral and the ethical awareness right whenever there is an injury there is a lesion to this what will happen there will be the clownish behavior euphoric and the vulgar speech they will not understand what to speak where to speak and how to speak those problems will be there and uh, their behaviors will be affected right coming to the <coughs> the parietal uh, coming to the this if you see over here this is the block of speech area very important we have already discussed about this pars triangularis and the pars opercularis right the pars triangularis is area number 45 whereas the pars opercularis is area number 45 of the inferior frontal gyrus right so when we talk about this broca's speech area right this this is the uh, we say the motor speech areas of the broca's which is present basically on the inferior frontal gyrus and as i said it is uh, between the anterior ascending rami and the uh, the uh, you have this ascending rami this is the pars triangularis area number 45 and then you have the ascending rami the posterior to the ascending rami or you can say between the uh, ascending rami and the posterior ramus this is the pars opercularis the area number 45 right now this helps 
uh, the function you can say this is the production helps in the production of the expressive speech or the vocalization right so in the majority of the individual this area is important uh, on the left or you say the dominant hemisphere why because the ablation will result in the paralysis of the speech right and in those individuals in whom uh, you say that uh, the right hemisphere is dominant the area on the right side is of importance right so accordingly what i wanted to say that the ablation of this reason right in the non dominant hemisphere has no effect on the speech right so the broca's speech area brings about the you say the formation or the articulation of the words right and its connections with the adjacent you say the primary motor areas or you say the muscles of the larynx the mouth uh, you say the tongue, the soft palate, and other uh, muscles. I mean to say the respiratory muscles, which are appropriately stimulated along with this. So the lesions, I said, because of that, it will have the motor, motor aphasia, a grammatical and non infant uh, speech will be there, right? So these are the uh, things. Coming to the next, that is the parietal lobe. Now, when we see this parietal lobe. It includes uh, almost one fifth of the total cortex, you can say, right? And you can appreciate over here, uh, this is the primary somatosensory area, and then we have the secondary somatosensory area. Apart from that, the sensory speech area is also related to this parietal lobe. Now, when we see this primary sensory area, in this uh, slide, you can appreciate this primary sensory area. This is the post central gyrus. You can appreciate over here right this is the uh, central sulcus right so posterior to the central sulcus and uh, you say the anterior to the posterior central sulcus you have right post uh, this area you can appreciate over here is the uh, the primary somatosensory area right this is the uh, primary somatosensory area you can appreciate over here right now in the diagram you can appreciate the area number, Broadman's area is three, one, and two, right? So this is the primary uh, somesthetic or the somato, uh, somatic sensory area, you can say, right? The area number three, one, two. Now, when we see over here, it is concerned with the perception of, uh, you say, the extraceptive and the proprioceptive sensations from the opposite half of the body, right? I repeat, I said it is concerned with the perception of extraceptive and the prior, uh, proprioceptive sensations from the opposite half of the body it receives uh, the projections from the ventral posterolateral and the ventral posteromedial nuclei of the thalamus and when there is a lesion of this area it will result to the loss of extraceptive and the proprioceptive sensation from the opposite half of the body right so this is all about the primary uh, sensory this uh, we have already discussed about this so we'll not uh, repeat again over here but in the diagram again you can appreciate over here the opposite half of the body is uh, re uh, represented as inverted over here you can see this is the pharyngeal region right the tongue and then you have the teeth gums and the jaws over here you can appreciate right which are represented in the most inferior part of the post central gyrus you can say which is followed by the face you can see over here right this is the face and then if you can appreciate over here you have the fingers you have the thumb over here you have the hand right the arm over here you can appreciate the tongue trunk over here right and the thigh you can appreciate over here right and then leg and the foot areas uh, which are found on the medial surface of the hemisphere in the posterior part of the paracentral lobule now apart from that if you remember i said even the anal or you say the genital regions are also found in the this paracentral uh, lobule area right and when you see this uh, apportioning of the cortex or you say uh, for a particular or a ident means a particular area of the body which is related to the functional importance rather than to its size. You can see over here the uh, face and the lips, how much area has been given, right? 
Similarly, you can see the index finger or the thumb has been particularly given or assigned a larger area, right? So what I said that the size of the cortical area will be allocated or will be demarcated to each part of the body directly proportional to the number of the sensory receptors present in that part of the body that is regard, uh, uh, as per the skill required, you say. Now we see over here, the secondary uh, somesthetic area you can see over here, that is posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus over here. You can see the, <clears throat> if you see this posterior ramus of the lateral sulcus over here, you can appreciate, right? This is the secondary somesthetic area you can appreciate, right? There will be the bilateral uh, representation will be there. So when we talk about this secondary somesthetic area, it is the superior leaf of the posterior limb, you can say, right? The upper part of the posterior limb, you can say, of the lateral sulcus or the fissure, you can say. And when we talk about this secondary sensory area, which is much smaller, right? Which is much smaller and less important, you can say, than the primary sensory area you can see over here, right? And the face area lies anterior and the leg area will be located posterior, right? So the function when you see, uh, it assists uh, with the integration and the interpretation of the sensation relative to the body position and the orientation in the space, you can say, right? So bilaterally represented with the contralateral side, the, the dominant, you can say. So this is all about the secondary somesthetic area. Coming to the if you see over here, the another area that is the somesthetic association area, the Broadman area number five and seven, if you can appreciate, right? The somesthetic sensation, if you see, it occupies the superior parietal lobule, right? You can appreciate over here. This is the parietal lobule, and this is the superior part of the parietal lobule, which is extending into the medial surface of the hemisphere, that is the area number five and seven, right? So this area will have many connections, you can say, uh, with the sensory area of the cortex again. And when you say the function of this area, the main function of the area is probably to receive and integrate the different sensory, the modalities you say, right? That is the perception of the shape, size, and the texture of the objects you say. Like when you say, the, we can take an example when uh, even it enables uh, individual, right, that when you uh, close some of the one's individual's eyes and you give some of the things in their hand, they can appreciate that, okay, what is there? Suppose it is glass, uh, what is the shape, what is the size, everything they can appreciate, right? And they can recognize even the eyes are closed. So that is the role of this, you can say. So this is all about the somesthetic association area, area number five and seven. Now, when we see this uh, sensory speech area, right, area number uh, 39 and the 40, we have discussed that is the supramarginal gyrus and uh, the angular gyrus you can appreciate over here. That is the uh, area number 39 and then we have the 40, right? Now, when we see this sensory speech area, what is the function? It is responsible for the process of the learning such as reading, writing, and the computing, right? So these are the basically functions of the, you say the area number 39 or the 40, which is located on the angular gyrus and the supramarginal gyrus uh, respectively, you can say, right? Now, when we see the vernix area, if, if you appreciate, right? This vernix area is concerned with the understanding of the speech. That is, you say the interpretation of the language. That is uh, through, you can say, the visual or you can say the auditory input, right? So this, the warnings area, and if you see over here, uh, what I said is the, uh, which is uh, the area number 39 or the uh, 40, which is present on the angular of the supramarginal gyrus, these are responsible for the process of the learning, such as reading, writing, and the computing. Then apart from that, what I said that it helps in the interpretation of the language through visual and the auditory input. Now, when we see over here, 
when there is a lesion to this area, right, there will be loss of ability to understand uh, the what have been spoken and what are the uh, the written speech area will be there. Like uh, they will have difficulty, uh, like Alexia, they will have difficulty in writing the words or the and they will have difficulty in speaking the uh, or even in the simple calculation, they will have problem, right? That is the A calculia, and they will have difficulty in the naming, anomia, right? So these are the difficulties they will be facing. That is the alexia, a graphia, a calculia, uh, and anomia, right? So when we see that these are the things which will be affected. Now, what do you mean by the global aphasia? Now, uh, when there is an involvement of both Broca the speech area, that what we said the area 44 and 45, and the Wernicke area, that is the area number 39 and uh, 40. What I said that the Wernicke area is concerned with the understanding of the speech, or you say the interpretation of the language through you say the visual or the auditory input. So whenever there is a lesion of both, that is the Broca's areas and the Wernicke's area that will result in the loss of production of the speech as well as the loss of understanding of the spoken and the written speech. So the Broca's speech area, area number 44, 45, and the Wernicke's speech area, that is the area number we discussed, that is the 39 and the 40, right? So this is all about this. Then coming to the temporal lobe when we see over here, right? Now, when we see this temporal lobe, now, when we over here, you can appreciate this is the uh, temporal lobe. It covers one fourth of the total uh, cerebral cortex, you can say. And in the uh, over here, if you can appreciate, this is the primary auditory area. That is the area number 41, the Broadman's area number 41. Right. Apart from that, if you can appreciate over here, the auditory association area, that is the area number 42. And then after area number 41, 42, you can appreciate over here, that is the higher auditory association area, that is the area number 22, right? So these are the uh, Broadman's area you will be getting over here. As I said that this is the Fischl's gyrus, right? Towards the anterior aspect over here. And this Fischl's uh, gyrus, there you have the area number 41, that is the primary auditory area we have discussed in the previously also. And then just inferior to that, you have this is the over here, you are getting the auditory association area that is the 42, just posterior to the uh, primary auditory area, right? Now, when you see over here, apart from that, uh, whenever there is an injury to this area, this was the association area 22 also is there, right? So what I wanted to say that whenever there is an injury to this area, there will be uh, word deafness, right? So this is, I said that uh, this Hessel's gyrus is the part of this gyrus. This is the anterior aspect which you can appreciate over here, right? Where you find this primary auditory area, this primary auditory area, the area number 41 is called as the Hessel's gyrus. So whenever there is an injury to this, this is called as the word's deafness, right? Now, Coming to the secondary auditory area, just now we discussed, just posterior to that primary auditory area, you have the area number uh, 22 over here, right? This is the area number 22, just posterior to that. So 41, 42, and then you have the uh, 22 area that helps in the interpretation of the sound, right? Now, when we see this primary auditory area, that is the area number 41 and 42, I said, which you can appreciate over here right? This is the uh, primary auditory area. Now, this includes, as I said, somebody was asking, that is the Hessel's gyrus or the gyrus of the Hessel, you say, which is the superior surface on the, uh, you say, the superior temporal gyrus. And even on the superior surface of the superior temporal gyrus, if you say, towards the, uh, uh, on the superior border, there will be anterior transverse temporal gyrus. And that gyrus, we call it as the, uh, the gyrus of the Hessel, right? So when we see this area number 41 and 42, it is situated on the inferior wall of the lateral sulcus over here, right? Now, when we see this area number 41, 
you can appreciate over here, right, is uh, will be having this granular type of the cortex, right? Whereas when you talk about this AA number 42, it will have the homotypical and is mainly, and uh, you say uh, this area, either you say the area number 41 or the 40, uh, 42, I said these are homotypical and is mainly and the auditory associated area will be there. And this, the if you see uh, the area number two, uh, 22, this will help in the interpretation of the sound. So this is all about the temporal lobe. Now coming to the, uh, you say, this occipital lobe, apart from that, in this you can very well appreciate the secondary auditory area, the area number 22, which is just so situated posterior to the primary auditory area you can appreciate, right? So when you see over here, this is the secondary auditory area, uh, the area number 22, right? Now it receives the impulses from the primary auditory area, which you can appreciate over here, that is the area number 41 and 42 over here, right? Now, apart from that, it also receives inputs from the halmus, right? Now, what happens that whenever there will be the secondary auditory area, uh, right, uh, thought is there, it will interpret, as I said, that the main role of the secondary auditory area is the interpretation of the sounds, right? And for the associations of the auditory input uh, with other sensory information, right? Now, coming to the uh, occipital lobe, when we say it is the covers the one fourth of the total cerebral cortex, you can see over here, right? This is the occipital lobe, and in the occipital lobe, if you can appreciate, right? We have the time, so it is seven o'clock, right? Sorry for it; it, it been two hours. Okay, now when we see over here, this is the primary visual area you can appreciate over here, area number 17, right? Now, when we see over here, this is the primary visual area. You can see this is the, uh, if you can appreciate the area number 39, that is the higher visual association area. We have discussed the area number 39 and the 40 also, right? So we have this calcarine sulcus. This is the, uh, uh, over here, you have this primary visual area at the calcarine sulcus, which is extending towards the supralateral surface, right? Now, what is the basic function which you see? The perception of the isolated visual impressions, like you can say the color, size, form, motion, and the illumination, right? Whenever there is a lesion to this primary visual area, what will happen? There will be homonymous hemianopia. What will happen? That bilateral, either you say the both side, right side, or both left side, the uh, lesion will be affected. You can see the both left side in the left homonymous hemianopia due to the lesion of the right occipital lobe. The opposite side has been, the both left side has been affected, right? So that is homonymous hemianopia. Now coming to the secondary visual area, when you see over here, this secondary visual area which surrounds, right? So over here, you have this, uh, secondary visual area, the area number 18 and the 19. So over here, you can appreciate this is the area number 18 and over here you have this 19, right? So these relate, whatever the received visual informations are there, right? This will be there. So what I wanted to say that the secondary visual area will surround the primary visual area, which you can appreciate over here, right? On the medial, as well as even on the supralateral surface of the hemisphere, right? So this area receives the different fibers. You say the afferent fibers from the area number 17 and other cortical areas as well as from the thalamus, right? So when we talk about the function of the secondary visual area, I said it relates the, uh, the visual, whatever the visual in information will be received, it will relate to that, right? So uh, from the primary visual area and apart from that, whatever the past visual experiences were there, right? That also will be interpreted by the secondary visual area. So this will help, or you can say, this will enable the person to recognize and appreciate what he or she is seeing, even in the, uh, you say, uh, during the dark and all. That will help in the interpretation, right? So this will help in recognizing what is being seen. So, uh, 
homonymous amenopia i said that it is the visual field defect which involving either to right or to left halves of the visual fields of the both eyes so we'll just try to finish it off right other cortical areas you will be getting that is the test area area number 43 right and over here you can see this is the test area the gustatory cortex or the test area you can appreciate and then apart from that we have already discussed that is the visual cortex or the visual area you are getting in the uh, occipital lobe right so this is all about uh, this test area you can see that this test area is situated in the lower end of the post central gyrus you can see over here the post central gyrus is there and it is uh, situated it is located in the uh, you say the lower or the uh, posterior aspect of the uh, post central gyrus you can say right so this is area number 43 the vestibular area if you can appreciate it's believed to be situated near the uh, part of the post central gyrus uh, you if you appreciate over here this will be there in that in the deep right so the vestibular area and the vestibular part if you appreciate that is the auditory if you see over here this is the auditory area right the visual area and the vestibular part of the inner ear are concerned with the appreciation of the positions and the movements of the head in the uh, space you say right that is the vestibular area so this is all about this other cortical area now when we see this anatomical examinations of the two cerebral hemisphere that shows the cortical gyri you can say right and the fissures and these are almost identical you you can say but still there will be the cerebral dominance though there are uh, similarity when you see the anatomically when you examine the cerebral hemisphere both will be identical the right and the left cerebral hemispheres are in uh, with reference to the cortical gyri and the feces right so this is all about i'll just try to finish this this is all about thank you so much right this was very hectic too long i think we have taken more than two hours now Oh, Dr. Ravi, you know, although it has been very exhaustive, but I would say it was very, very much informative also from your part, wherein, you know, we have been able to, you know, actually, you know, open up the, uh, the, 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 the insights of this particular subject, which is anatomy of the cerebral hemisphere. And, you know, we do have actually a lot of questions here. So we're not taking much of our time, but I'll ask you a few of the questions which are there on the Q&A panel. I can right see now. one question over here. Okay. Uh, can I see the chat box? Sure, sir. You can. You have an access, sir. Oh, right. I mean, which option is better to use the five lobes, as you mentioned in slide? Usually, there are four lobes only, right? When we talk about the lobes of the cerebral hemisphere, we discuss about the four lobes only. That is the frontal lobe right and then we uh, talk about the parietal lobe then we have the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe because we, we cannot see this insula that is the fifth lobe which is deeply situated i said that when you uh, reflect uh, right the two lips uh, at the lateral sulcus right the stem of the lateral sulcus then only you will be able to see uh, this the uh, you say the insula that is the fifth lobe so when the options are there Usually it is the four lobes only. Right, then, okay. So there uh, are some more questions like, you know, uh, there were some, uh, some general question also. So they want to know that actually, you know, what kind of, in examination point of view, uh -huh. what kind of questions will be asked, you know, in this particular uh, segment? Uh, right, in the very important question, right, you must know, because this, if you see the cerebral hemisphere, that may be asked as a long question, right? So you have to describe the external features, right? The external features of the, or the gross features of the, this cerebral hemisphere and add a note, add a note on the functional areas, right? And apart from that, the blood supply of the cerebral hemisphere, that blood supply uh, of the brain itself is a long uh, uh, means it, it's a separate lecture i will be taking in a different uh, lecture 
right? So the question in the university examination, it is asked as the external, describe the external features with the suitable diagram, right? And add a note on the, or you can get a separate questions, describe the functional areas of the uh, cerebral cortex, whatever else there, or the blood supply of the cerebrum, right? Or the brain. So this way, the questions are asked, right? So the first year MBBS, would you give an idea questions will be asked, right? So this is way uh, the questions are asked uh, regarding the long questions, short questions, maybe only to draw the diagram of the different uh, surfaces, right? Or you can say the insula or the, the different uh, lobes, different poles, all these diagrams can be asked. In the MCQs, the different areas, the functional areas can be asked that, okay, what are the broca, the speech area, what are the vernix areas, all these, what are the primary motor areas, these questions may be asked as a uh, uh, MCQ. Then apart from that, even uh, you may be asked, so suppose uh, this blockers speech areas, there will be laser, the uh, case based, you may be asked, right, in the MCQ, that suppose this area, there will be laser in this area, what are the uh, uh, features you will be getting, right? What are the conditions, the abnormal conditions, the clinical features you will be getting in the patients? So those questions you might get uh, uh, with reference to the examinations, you can say, right? Then somebody is asking, the questions you know which are there what is the histogenesis of brain histogenesis see this is histo histologic uh, i have not covered over here that will be dealt in the separate class if i say we will discuss that's why today because i was sure that it will be long question long two hours it is there one question so we will try to cover another lecture on the histology of the cerebrum or the cerebellum right so that's the reason I didn't discuss much about the histogenesis. Another question I'm getting about the cerebral dominance. So what do you mean by the cerebral uh, dominance? As I said, that whenever you see the cortical gyri, you say, or the feces, uh, you see of the right or the left cerebral hemispheres, both are almost identical, right? But when you see uh, the, in case of the cerebral dominance, the more than 90% of the adult population is right-handed. And therefore, you can see that the left hemisphere is dominant. So cerebral dominance can be defined as the, uh, the ability of the individual, of the one cerebral hemis hemisphere, you can say, which is referred to as the left or uh, the right hem cerebral hemisphere, which is particularly uh, controlling some of the particular uh, task, you can say, right? So this is all about then. Okay, another question I'm getting, that is global aphasia. Just now I mentioned that when both lesions will be there, that is the Wernick area and the Broca's speech area. The uh, Broca's speech area, that is the area number 44 and the area number 45, if both are involved and the Wernick areas, that is area number 39 and 45, uh, 40, both are involved, there will be loss of the production of the speech, right? As well as even the loss of the understanding of the spoken and the written speech so that will together it is called as the uh, global aphasia right so this is all about i think more questions i can take on the uh, email you can note down my email right already it is uh, two hours 10 minutes i think we have yes sir yes sir in fact in fact you oh. know what i'm we gonna do is there are questions more questions no doubt about it and there are also more topics when a student wants you to conduct a uh, session on those topics, so I'll share with you. Already, Walter Stover is requesting four or five lectures, so we'll take individually, <laughs> right? Next, uh, sure, you can note uh, the blood supply of the brain is for the different institutions because last time from the Walter Clover, I have taken this lecture. If yes, uh, people will see again, if uh, if needed, I'll take the blood supply of the brain also, right? But sure. on fifteenth, the same guest lecture is there on the blood supply of the brain for the Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences, Maharashtra, right? So I will ask them if they will allow to share the link. I will share uh, with you all also, right? So uh, I'm sure, not sir. able to sir, I, question, you, I share you, please share the link with me. So what I'll do is I'll share with my uh, part of the, you know, people that and the students that we have in our databases. And I'll share okay. the same link with all the people. So people right. can join and get the, you know, the, the information that they need. 
so why i'm not able to type the message okay are you able to see my email id uh just hold on sir i'll just check yes okay, sir so can, can any questions are there you can you are most welcome and then uh, i'll try to share the whatsapp link um, uh, sorry not whatsapp link the zoom link uh, of the krishna institute of medical sciences if they will allow to attend the uh, guest lecture on the blood supply of the brain which is scheduled on 15th of this month right sure sir sure, sir. sure. definitely sir please share the link share the link right. with us also so we can also populate this link with the other and people. don't worry uh, uh, from the voltus clover i will i will be taking five more four lectures i guess they are uh, uh, saying so whatever topics you want you just uh, message or mail to us right we will uh, consider those topics definitely sure sir sure sir uh, sure sir definitely sir so uh, sir thank you so much dr ravi you, you have been a uh, very you know very very you know uh, you know auspicious i would say uh, very very perennial uh, you know uh, presenter for waters clover who has actually presented almost like more than 50 almost like 50 sessions for us in the last in the last two years and yes sir we are going to continue your expertise use of expertise in the subject topic and yeah, and and for sure. But they should. I would suggest they should read a standard textbook. In the examination, the questions will always from the standard textbook, right? Yes, absolutely, sir. Mm. That I've seen. I've seen few comments on the feedback form that I have circulated, sir. When they have actually mentioned that the, this book, the book you have edited, actually, Sanskrit anatomy, has been actually very good in terms of uh, diagrams in terms of the insight uh, knowledge of the subject see the book uh, is uh, definitely it is not only uh, for your first mbbs half of the portion if you say it is full of the questions right the mcq and even for the examination which will be asked in the uh, university examination so when you see the thickness you don't uh, see about the thickness because most of the things half of the things are the mcq which you will which will be helpful in the university examination which will be helpful in the neat examination us mle and plab so keeping those things in mind we have continued with the mcq on the case based questions right and when you talk about the first mbbs when you go only through the text the flow charts and whatever the sum uh, summaries are there the key concepts are there that will be more than enough when you go through the diagrams right so i would i would recommend or i would suggest that always try to read the standard textbook right not only the snails clinical neuroanatomy but other standard textbook also because in the pg examination in the usmle or plab the questions will be from the standard textbook remember this right so uh, even the topper the first uh, topper means uh, of the neat pg she had shared that this book has helped her a lot in clearing the entrance examination right so definitely this will be useful because again during the PG examination you will have to read these books the standard textbook so why not from the beginning right Absolutely, sir. Absolutely, very well, sir. Sir, you know the you know the recent PG topper, uh, you know in neat PG, you know she is actually recommended this textbook, and we have actually. Are you please sir, share me with the video, the video, sir. I will share that video with the my colleagues also, right? I'll do that, sir. I'll do that, sir. I'll do that for sure. Thank and you so much. Thank, uh, for, at the end, I want to conclude this session. Thank Dr. Sish Kumar Ravi for conducting this session. Very informative. We got very good, uh, you know, uh, restriction as well as attendance. And also, uh, in future, we'll be requested or Ravi to conduct more such sessions for water clovers and also for the students who are actually seeking for the, you know, the in-depth knowledge and more knowledge in terms of topics that, that you know, they read. Thank you, sir. Thank you Thank so much, you sir. much, sir. Thanks a lot. Thanks.